The idea of a thank offering or thanksgiving is a biblical uh, concept. It's a biblical idea. Uh, in fact, the, um, we call it communion. When we take communion here the first Sunday of every month, the uh, Catholic Church often calls it the Eucharist. And that is because the word Eucharist means to give thanks. When uh, Jesus broke the bread and gave thanks, the word used there in the Greek is Eucharistio. And so even the idea of us taking communion and us, uh, you know, remembering the body and blood of Jesus is meant to be an act of thanksgiving. When you study Old Testament worship, it was almost always uh, built around thanksgiving. So you would have these feasts where the Jewish people would actually leave their homes for weeks, sometimes almost a full month, and they would travel and they would set up tents and they would stay together. And the general theme of the feast was celebration. It was a time of intentional thanksgiving, thank offerings to God as they looked back on all that God had done and all that God had delivered his people from, as they considered God's blessing in their own lives, and as they looked forward to what God had for their future, and the obvious and uh, implied attitude being one of gratefulness, one of thankfulness. And so Old Testament worship, when you really look at it, it centered around just being grateful to God for who God is, for what God has done, and what God is going to do. It's interesting that the fundamental sin of the Gentiles is said to be their failure to honor Him and give thanks. I want to show it to you in just a moment. If you're unfamiliar with the term Gentile, it just means anybody who's not a follower of God. And in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, and Romans chapter 3, are meant to teach us that all of us are sinners. All of us. That every, if you've ever heard the, the, the uh, statement, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that's from Romans, the first three chapters of Romans. Now, the first chapter of Romans is devoted to Gentiles. And the whole chapter is meant to point out that even though they're not followers of God, they are still guilty before God because... Nature itself testifies. Their consciences testify. And even though they know that nature testifies to God, even though they know that their consciences warn them of their wicked ways, they refuse anyways. That's the main point of Romans chapter 1. And it's that therefore God is righteous even in judging sinners. But what I want you to see is the conclusion. Romans chapter 1, there's this big list of all the things that Gentiles have done and why they're guilty before God. But the great big conclusion is this. Uh, I don't have it for them in the back. I didn't give them this in my notes. So I'm just going to read it to you. Um, let's read, ver I'll start in verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give God. Thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So, the great big sin, the great big conclusion was that even the Gentiles refused to give thanks to God, and consequently their hearts were darkened. This morning, when I talk about Thanksgiving, Understand that primarily true thanksgiving is an attitude or a position of the heart. It's not just something that we do. It's not some deed or act that we do. It is a position of the heart. And what I want to say is that ultimately as Christians, we should be the most thankful people on earth. And I ask the question sincerely... Are we, though? While it is true that we should be the most thankful people on earth, the question is, are we the most thankful people on earth? 
This morning, I ask you, individually as a person, would you consider yourself among the most thankful people on earth? A New Testament passage speaking of thankfulness in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. All right, so two things to note here. First of all, if we are to give thanks in all circumstances, no matter what we're going through, then obviously and clearly we should be the most thankful people on earth. If our thankfulness is not tied to any given situation, but that in all situations we should be thankful, then yes, clearly we should be the most thankful people on earth. But I also want you to take a note at these words, for this is the will of God. This is the will of God. It's not the only will of God, but it is a clear will of God. And you know, for a lot of us as Christians, we wonder, a lot of people ask me, what is the will of God for my life? We wonder, what is God's will for my life? Understand, this is one of the few places in the entire Bible that you will find that statement said clearly. There's not a lot of other places we can point to like this. And so one of the places that God goes out of his way to make sure that you and I understand his will for your life is right here. And he says his will is that in all circumstances that we are thankful. So yes, Christians should be the most thankful people on earth. But I want to ask the question, why? Why should we be? Why is it the will of God? This morning I'm going to share four reasons that we should be the most thankful people on earth. And what I want to ask you to do with me this morning is I want to ask you to work hard to consider what I'm about to say. I'm going to tell you why you're going to have to work hard to do it. There Some of the greatest attributes of our faith are attributes that we hear over and over and over and over and over and over again. Well, if you've heard it 10,000 times in your life and you show up to church on a Sunday morning, you're kind of looking for something maybe that you hadn't heard before. For example, and this isn't one of my points this morning, though it could be, when I say God loves you. Most of us have heard that so often that hearing that has no more impact on our life. And it should if we'll stop and think about the fact that God loves you. That's a game changer. But you see, I had to slow it down, and I had to make sure I said it in such a way that it has a little bit of impact. There's not a single point that I'm about to share with you that doesn't fall under the same category. Yet, these things that I'm going to share this morning are mind-blowingly awesome. And so I want to ask you, I want to challenge you, work hard to really allow yourself to think on these things and don't think to yourself, well, yep, I know, next. Now stop and meditate on what does it mean. So let's look at four reasons that Christians should be the most thankful people on earth. Number one, God hears our prayers. God hears our prayers. The psalmist is talking about the mess that he's in. He's talking about how his enemies are coming against him. People are coming against him. They want to destroy him for no reason. So things aren't going real well on his earthly life. But thank God he has someone to talk to about it. And not just someone to talk to, but someone who can do something about it. Folks, it is incredibly significant, important, awesome, that if you're a Christian... God listens to you. Think about that. God listens to you. Could you imagine? I didn't use this analogy last service because I was afraid it would be funny. It's not meant to be funny. But could you imagine if you were able to call the President of the United States, if you had a personal cell phone number for Joe Biden, and every single time you called, he had to answer the phone. 
You probably have some, some wild conversations. But just imagine it for, for a moment, sincerely, if you had that type of access to the President of the United States. Never put on hold, never answered by his secretary, never told he couldn't take your call, but you, you had the power to simply pick up the phone and dial and the President of the United States every single time without fail, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, hello? That's a powerful thought. But God gives you that same access as his son or daughter. That is an incredible thought that God listens to you. And what I'm wanting to do today is contrast why we as Christians should be the most thankful people on the planet. Because non-Christians, listen, God does not hear your prayers. This is not a super popular thing to say anymore in today's time where we want everybody to feel good, but you need to know the fact is if you are a sinner who has not repented of your sins and you're not following the Lord Jesus Christ, God does not hear your prayers. This is something that is unique and special to God's sons and daughters is that he listens to them. It is said clearly in John chapter 9 and verse 31, we know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. In the Old Testament, it is said like this in Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. So to the sinner, you need to understand that in your time of trouble, when the world's coming against you and everything's going wrong, there isn't anybody you can actually talk to about it that can do anything about it. The first prayer that God hears for the sinner is the prayer of honest repentance where I confess to God, Lord, I am an enemy of yours. I have sinned against you. I am living for myself. I am not following you. Please forgive me. And Lord, I turn my life to you. Father, save me in Jesus' name. That is the first prayer that God has promised to hear from the lips of the sinner. And if it makes you offended to think, well, God doesn't hear sinners, just consider with me how irrational of a thought it is that he would. So here's the attitude of the sinner. God, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to do what your word tells me to do. I don't care what you say. But you better listen to me. I need you to do this, and I need you to do that. How irrational is that? It's complete nonsense. And so God does not hear the prayer of sinners, but for the righteous. For his sons and daughters. What an awesome thought, folks. God listens to you. Man, it's a game changer when you realize what, when you hit your knees and you begin to speak to God that the eternal creator of heaven and earth, the one who has all power and authority over all things, he listens to you. What an awesome uh, attribute. What an awesome blessing it is to be a Christian. Just think about it for a moment that Almighty God listens to you. You and I who were once enemies of God, God took us and reconciled us through the blood of Jesus. He supernaturally translated us into the kingdom of light, adopted us as sons and daughters, calls us his own, and listens to us when we have something to say. That is mind-blowing to me to think that I, when I need to be heard, that of all people that are committed to hearing me, it is God. Man, that is awesome. Now listen to me. Sometimes 
when God answers, God hears this. You need to understand something about God hearing your prayers. That does not always mean that God answers the way you want him to answer. But the very fact that he answers at all is amazing. I spent hours, and I mean hours plural, thinking about this section of this point this week. Because I don't know how to communicate it very well. There are a couple hours I told my wife, I'm like, I've got to get away and I just need some time to think because I'm trying to communicate something that's really hard. And this is the best way I can explain it. I said, I'm trying to communicate how it's possible that being told no can be so great that it drives us to a place of praise. Because we don't like to be told no. But as I, I, I saw it in that context this week, folks, that even God telling me no sometime is so amazing that he even heard me at all, that he even cared to answer that in and of itself that I called out, God heard my prayer, and said no. That is so awesome that God would hear me and answer me. And I was trying to think, how can I even share any type of analogy that would somehow make sense of that? And I spent hours trying to think of it, and I couldn't. So part of me hopes that the Holy Spirit will help you to sort of see it the way I saw it this week. And then I'm going to give you an analogy that was the weakest I could come up with. It just was not good. But it was this. There are times in our life as parents that Andrea and I have had to tell our kids no. And not always could we explain it, and, I'm not being mean, but even when we did try to explain it, sometimes our little brains weren't smart enough to understand it at certain ages. Sometimes we just couldn't give them all the information because it wouldn't have been healthy for them at a young age to give them all the information and why the answer is no. But over the years, there have been times that our kids have come through their life and they're looking back on it, and they've literally expressed to us, Mom, Dad, we're grateful for that period of time in our life when you said no to that thing. Or, and sometimes it's even more general. It's just like we're grateful that even though we didn't always understand why you made the decisions you did, we're thankful for the, you know, we see now that there was a purpose behind it. And my thought was this. If this is true in our human relationships, right, with parenting, how much more true is it in our relationship with God? And sometimes we just have to trust that God's answer of no is the best possible answer for us. And it doesn't always make sense. You know, there are a lot of times when we as God's people, the answer was no. We wanted God to do something and God didn't do what we were asking him to do. But years later, we get years down the road and we look back at that time of life. And here's what we learn. God didn't do exactly what I wanted him to do. And I might not even fully understand now why it happened the way it did. But here's what I do know. I look back at it. And I see that God was with us through it all, that God was there, that we were never alone that God was faithful, and that through it all, there were some things that God did in my life and in the people around me that probably would not have got done had we not went through what we went through. And so while God didn't answer exactly like I wanted him to, while God's answer may have felt like no, I realized that the very fact that God heard me, God was involved in our life, God was with me through it, that is enough for me, and there should be this sense of gratitude that I've got a relationship with the God of heaven and earth, with Almighty God, and He answers, and even when He answers no, it is a blessing to me because I realize He's listening to me. As I was meditating on that thought this week, trying to figure out how do I somehow say that, the song came across the radio. We sing it here sometimes. It's a newer song, but the, the bridge says, I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. It changed the way I saw that bridge. Before meditating on this, when I heard that bridge, every time I thought of it in the context of God answering yes. Like I asked God to do something and God did it. But that's not even what the bridge says. All it says is I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. It changed the way I saw it. And that's what I thought. God always answers. That is awesome. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's wait. Sometimes it's maybe. Sometimes it's like, well, I'm going to answer your prayer, but I'm going to do it different than you think because what really needs to happen is different than what you think needs to happen. And sometimes the answer is just no. One of the healthiest things that ever happened in my life that brought me to where I am today was a no answer. I knew God had called me to preach. I knew God's hand was on my life. I knew I was called to ministry. 
And so I went to the pastor of the church that I was at, and I said, I believe God's called me to ministry. I feel like I need to be involved doing some things. And is there anything here possibly that you guys could do to get me involved? Here was the answer, no. By Gary Ledbetter himself. Wise answer. It was somewhat of a shock to me because I thought, well, it's a big church. There's a lot to do here. And he didn't have to explain his answer to me, but he did. He said, son, I've got 15 preachers out there who say they're called to preach, sitting on their hands doing nothing every week. He said, we've already got just about every position here really filled in such a way there's not a lot of room for me to figure out how to make you work. You believe you're called and you want to be doing ministry every week? You need to leave and you need to go somewhere else where they'll put you to work. And he said, I've got an idea for you. A little church down in Wellington, Kansas, got about 50, 60 people in it, just started about a year ago. You ought to go down and just sit in a service there and see if you feel like maybe there's somehow God could use you there. And if you know my story, my wife and I ended up there, spent five years learning some of the most important, crucial years of my, my life before God called us to start this church here. That no answer that day was one of the most significant, important answers that I ever received in all of my life. It played a big role in getting me to where I am today. And so sometimes, folks, the answer is no. And I don't know about you, but I don't like being told no. When we ask something, we typically ask something because we sincerely believe getting what we're asking for is in the best interest of everybody involved. And so when we hear no, we don't like it. But the fact is that God does hear His people even when the answer is no. And so we pray. And here's the awesome thing. The Bible teaches not only that we pray, not only the fact that God hears our prayers, but it, this is what it tells us, folks. It tells us we should pray with a sense of confidence, like with a sense of boldness. In Hebrews 4.16, it says it this way, Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Consider the picture with me. So the throne of grace, the throne of grace is, is where God sits. Try to visualize whatever it is in your mind where God is right now. With, and think about Revelations telling us there's beams of light that are flying out from His throne. And, and, and there's, there's all these amazing colors. And that His voice is like the voice of a thousand rushing waters. And there's God sitting on that throne. How would you approach that throne? In our earthly mind and in our flesh, it'd be pretty timidly. Hebrews says, you and I, as the sons and daughters of God, we are to approach that throne of grace with confidence. Man, that's an awesome thought. Not only does God hear our prayers, He wants to hear our prayers, and He wants us to have such a confidence in, in the fact that He wants to hear us that when we come to Him, we come with a sense of boldness and confidence. Father, I have something to say, knowing that He wants to hear it, and that He hears and that He answers. This is one amazing reason that we should be thankful. It's the incredible fact that as Christians, one of the privileges that we have that the rest of the world does not is that we can go confidently before God in prayer and He hears our prayers. Number two, the second reason we should be thankful is that God has rescued us out of this wicked world. You know, when we look at Psalm 56, and things I, I love about the Bible, and I love especially about the Psalms, is that you'll find this thankfulness to God, like, I must give God thanks. I will praise the Lord. You find it in context when people are struggling with what's going on around them. I mean, the Psalm 56, it starts out with, my life is being threatened. People are hunting me down. My enemies are coming against me for no reason. But it concludes with, God's with me, and God is my God. And it, and it shows us this, that we as God's people, that though our feet walk on this earth, we're not part of it. In another, in another place, the Bible says that we are pilgrims in this land and that we are citizens of a heavenly citizenship, of a heavenly city, of a heavenly kingdom. And so God has rescued us out of this world. In other words, we're no longer held captive to the things of this world, captive to this world system. 
This week as I was meditating on this particular thought, I thought to myself, if there is any, if if there is any such way, I really hesitate to use this word, but if there was any such way that it was a blessing that I went through the horrendous four to five years of life that I went through when I got way off into crime and drugs and everything else, if there was any type of blessing that comes out of that, it's this, that for me, my salvation was so in such contrast to the world that I came out of that I had this great appreciation that I was no longer entangled in it. And, and I remember when I got born again and God gave me a new nature and put His Spirit within me, I remember literally looking back on my life thinking, what was I thinking? How did I enjoy living the life of a liar? I mean, there's no integrity in being a liar. But I was awesome at it. I'm like, what, how, did I, how did I have any sense of worth at all when I look at my life and I was, I was trapped in sin and, and I was a thief and I, I, st- and I stole and I was a cheater and I was a liar and I, and, and, I, and I allowed my own lust and my own wants and my own desires to control my life. I was a prisoner to sin. Well, once I came out of that life and God rescued me out of that life, it was unbelievable because those things that once had a hold on me, they not, not only did they no longer have a hold on me, but I hated those things. I, did, I wanted to be a million miles away from those things. So God rescues us out of this world system. Man, that's amazing to think that we could still live on earth, our feet walk this planet, sin surrounding us, and yet God give us the power to not be imprisoned by it any longer. In it, God has set me free. I'm no longer under the control of Pharaoh. I'm no longer a slave to Egypt. And while I walk this earth and I see the consequences of sin all around me, and it still to a degree impacts my experience on earth. Folks, as God's children, we're no longer trapped in that world anymore. We're no longer slaves to that world anymore. We don't work by the same rules as that world anymore. We have been set free from it. We have a new world. We live in God's kingdom. We have a new set of laws, a new set of life, a new set of rules because God has set us free. We are no longer slaves to the world because God's rescued us out of it. Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. This is not talking about heaven, folks. This is something that's already done. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. We're no longer under the domain of it. It does not control us. It does not own us. We have been pulled out of it. We have been set free as the sons and daughters of God. We've been rescued. And when I look around at all that's going on, and you look around at all that's going on, and we see the pain and destruction of the world, and we see how destructive sin is, and we see how hateful it can become, and how harmful it can become, when I look at all of it, I thank God God, you rescued me out of that world. You have pulled my feet out of that and firmly planted it on the rock of Jesus Christ. And I don't live like that anymore. And I don't think like that anymore. And I'm not held by captive that way anymore. I've been rescued out of this world. Number three this morning. Third reason we should be thankful, more thankful than anybody else on earth. Is because God is the object of our trust. The psalmist said it several times in, our, in the 13 verses, but let's look at verse 3. He said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. What is trust? Why do we need it? Why does it matter that God is who we put our trust in? Well, there's a little clue in how the sentence starts off, when I am afraid. When I am afraid. 
Let me explain when we need trust. And then let's pivot to why it's amazing that God is the object of our trust. We need trust when we are facing a circumstance we cannot control. That's what, that's what we need trust. That's when we need to trust in something or in someone. Is when we are facing a circumstance and we need a certain outcome, but we cannot control that outcome. And we are, if you will, uh, we, we have no choice but to put our hope in someone else to do it for us. That's what trust is. That's why it says, when I'm afraid. When I'm facing things I can't control, when I'm facing needs I cannot personally meet myself, it brings about this sense of fear. And the the psalmist says, when I am there, I put my trust in God. Now, I want to contrast why we as Christians should be the most thankful people on the earth. So let's, let's first of all consider everybody who's not a Christian. Who and what do they put their trust in? Man, when all goes wrong, what can they put their trust in? Who do they put their trust in? Their wealth? You could have millions of dollars and it'd be gone tomorrow. The dollar could collapse for that matter if things consider, continue the way they are in this country. And all of us could end up with next to nothing. You put your trust in your wealth? As a sinner, who do you put your trust in? You put it in people? When you think about it, it's actually a pretty hopeless feeling. You don't have God to put your trust in. This is actually one of the reasons that fear has overtaken the world. God predicted it. The Bible told us that in the end, right before the Lord Jesus comes back, that men's hearts would fail them because of fear. So one, one of the things that the Bible teaches us would be a sign of the return of the Lord is the whole world would be in fear. We've watched that happen in the last five years, haven't we, folks? But one of the reasons that there is this great uptick in panic and fear and mental disorders and everybody being sad and worried and frustrated and depressed well, there's a lot of reasons that they overlap. Part of it has to do with the 24-hour, non-stop barrage of information where we are told why we should be afraid. We've never lived in a time of history like this where literally the entire planet is constantly being given hour after hour after hour the reasons they should be afraid. But when you take an entire world of people, most of whom are not Christians, and you ask the question, what can they put their trust in? Well, the answer is nothing. And so they're constantly given these reasons why they should be afraid. There's nothing to put their trust in. And so we see this uptick of all of a sudden the world as a whole, every age group, dealing with more anxiety, more worry, more panic, more fear. But for you and I who are Christians, our trust, is in God. And that sets us apart from the rest of the world. This is why the psalmist can say, when I'm afraid, I'll just, I put my trust in God. Our trust is in God. And on one hand, when you consider people and things and wealth, nothing's worse than putting your trust in something that fails you. Nothing's worse than that. When, you're, when your you know, future or whatever you need is put in the hands of someone else, and they fail you, nothing's worse than that. It's a hopeless feeling. But for us, our hope is in our God who has never failed, who is always on time, who is all-knowing, who is all-powerful, who loves us with a perfect love. Our trust is in that God. For the Christian, our trust is in the one who cannot lie. Our trust is in the one who always does what he says he's going to do. Our trust is in our God who never fails. Our God, our trust is in our God who tramples over his enemies. Our God who defeated death, hell, and the grave. This is the one in whom we trust. Romans 8, 28 and verse 31 says it this way. And we know that for those who love God, 
all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Folks, when we face an uncertain future, we can simply know God is for us. Please keep in mind the context of Psalm 56. He says, everybody's coming against me. My people are coming against me. Enemies are coming against me. They've sought my life for no purpose. But, but, God, you are for me. This I know, God is for me. So the world might be not for you. The world is against us. The world in general wants to see us fall. The world wants to bring pain, death, and destruction. But on this hand, the one in whom I put my trust, God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? The one in whom we put our trust, folks. He's unshakable. When I face the sting of a job loss, When I face financial hardship, I'm reminded what David said in Psalm 37, that I have been young and I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. When I feel like I'm all alone, when I am facing the worst battles of my life, I'm reminded of what Jesus promised his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, when he said, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When we feel hated or persecuted by the world, when you and I feel like we have been tossed into the fires of persecution for being the few who are willing to stand for what is right and who are willing to stand for what is true, my mind goes to the three Hebrew boys who did the same thing. They were cast into the fire because they refused to bow down and worship the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember the story, Nebuchadnezzar looks in and not only are they not dead, but they are walking around and here's what Nebuchadnezzar said about it. He answered and said, Behold, I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the sons of the gods. I'm telling you folks, God is with us no matter what we're going through. And because of that, He is the object of our trust. And if God is the object of our trust, it doesn't matter what we face. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. I know that God is for me. And therefore, no matter what I go through in some way or another, God is going to use it for His glory. God's going to take it and use it for my good because my God is Almighty God. There is nothing that He cannot do. He is all wise. He is all knowing. He is all powerful. And because of that, I put my trust in Him. Even when I face death, I'm reminded of the promise that this perishable will put on the imperishable. That this mortal will put on immortality. And as the scriptures say, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? I trust in God, folks. We trust in God. He is immovable. What an object to trust in. The psalmist said it in verse 9. This I know. God is for me. Aren't you thankful that God is for us? Thankful that He's the object of our trust. He hears our prayers. He has rescued us out of this wicked world system. He is unfailing, never changing immovable object of our trust and finally this morning the fourth reason that we christians should be the most thankful people on earth is because god is coming for us again we are going to heaven this world is not our home jesus told his disciples john 14 verses 1 through 3 let not your hearts be troubled Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Context, context, context. You know what's happening in John 14? 
This is the last night of Jesus' life on earth. He's about to be crucified. And he's told his disciples that. He said, it's going to happen. Tomorrow's the day. I'm going to betray, be betrayed. I'm going to be brutally beaten and mocked and spit upon. It's going to be hard to endure just to watch it. And I will be crucified and I will die. Also, you're going to betray me. And you're going to be scattered. Peter, yours is going to be the worst. Not only are you going to do it, you're going to do it three times tonight. Before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. This is hard stuff. Then he says, but let not your hearts be troubled. Because I am leaving. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's what I'm leaving to do. And when I'm done, I am coming back. And I'm going to get you and you're going to come to be with me. What an awesome thought. I will say what I said earlier. That almost always when thankfulness and gratitude and not letting our hearts be troubled. Almost always in the scriptures when we find that con- that that. that uh, command or that idea, it is tied to going through difficulties on earth. Your life on earth is hard. What you're going to endure is going to be difficult. It's not going to be real pleasant here, but rejoice for I am with you, says the Lord. Rejoice because this world is not your home. You're just pilgrims passing through. You are citizens of a heavenly city. Rejoice because there is a home being built for you in heaven and the Lord is going to come back and He's going to take us there. Folks, you and I, this is not our home. God is preparing for us a place in heaven. It is greater than we can imagine. No eye has seen, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for us, heaven is going to be great. And folks, it is just for us, the sons and daughters of God. We ought to be the most thankful people on earth because God has redeemed us and heaven is ours. This world is not our home. I wanted to close with a look at heaven. And there are so many vivid explanations of it in Revelation. I'm like, God, I can't pick five verses. I can't pick just one or two. But I settled on verses one through five in Revelation 22. I just want you to look at this and try to picture where you're going this morning. If you're a Christian, this is where you're headed. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal. I was meditating on that, and I thought, I wish I could see what John saw and and how difficult it would have to be to know whatever I see, I have to use words that people who have never seen it could somehow relate to. And so I just kind of wonder, like, I tried to visualize what is this river of life, that is so bright, it's like a crystal. It's like something we've never seen, but there's this river there, and it, it's flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. So this main street that goes through this heavenly city, it's got this river that runs right through it, this river of crystal. And on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. So we have the water of life and the tree of life there. I believe these are literal things, but they are symbolic as well in that it is the water and the food. The water of life and the food of life. Everything we need to sustain us life, it's there. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. I love that simple sentence. No longer will there be anything accursed. All that is wrong, 
all that is accursed, there will be none of it there. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. There will be no darkness ever in heaven. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Hey, if you've been saved, if you are a Christ follower this morning, that is where you're headed. That's where we're going. When I look at all this wrong, it makes this so much more attractive. It makes me hunger for this. It makes me realize God wants His sons and daughters to have our eyes on His throne, on His heavenly city that He he is preparing for us, that this is where our hearts, our minds, this is where our eyes need to be. Think of it. Heaven. How could we not be thankful when we sincerely and truly think of it? I'm going to ask our worship team if you guys would get in place this morning. Now, I want to go back to Psalm 56, and I want, to, I want us to finish looking at a sentence, this conclusion that the author comes to. He says, I must perform my vows to you. It's I, I, I have to. I must. Oh, God, I will render thank offerings to you. He says, God, when I think about the fact that when I am afraid and I put my trust in you, Lord, the fact that I'm praying to you and I'm talking to you in the midst of all this mess that I am, there's a God who hears me. Lord, when I think that you are my deliverer, he says, God, when I meditate on these things, how could I possibly not offer thanksgiving to you? How could I not give you thanks? How could I not appreciate you and offer you my vows, offer you this song of praise, offer you this this poem of gratitude? How could I not offer you something of thanks, Lord, for all that you've done? I would submit that, brothers and sisters, when we sincerely think about the fact that God listens to you, That's awesome. When we sincerely think about the fact, God, you were an enemy of his, and he loved you, and he rescued you, and not only did he rescue you, but he adopted you into his family and calls you son, calls you daughter. When you really think about that, how could you not be thankful? When we think about the fact that when we are afraid and we are, there are certain things ahead of us we simply cannot control the outcome of. So our hope and our trust is put in God. He is the very object that we trust in. How could we not be thankful? When we think about the reality that this life is but a breath. The Bible says it's here one day, gone tomorrow. I mean, it's just like a breath. When we think about that, that all of this suffering that we're going through is just this light affliction compared to the eternal glory that awaits us. And I say this is why we should be the most thankful people on the earth. And I want to challenge you this week. I want to challenge you during this week of thanksgiving. Yes, be grateful for the things that you do have. Yes, be thankful for the family that you do have. Be thankful for the job you do have. Child of God, can we take our thankfulness into something even deeper? far more significant than things? And could we be intentional this week about focusing on why we as Christians should be the most thankful people on earth?